I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, will you or won't you? Will you or won't you? Jonah chapter 1. I read today from the King James text as always. <clears throat> now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Amen. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, Master, we love you, God. We thank you for the word of the Lord. We ask today, O oh God, that the anointing of the Holy Ghost 
would rest upon the messenger of God. I believe, Lord, this is one of the most important messages that any believer will ever hear. I need your help to deliver it effectively, to communicate it in such a way that the hearer might receive and be benefited thereby. Anoint today, O oh God, not only my lips, but also the ear of every hearer. Let the ear today be connected to the heart and not merely to the mind and to the hearing. Help us to receive from the Word of God today that which you would desire to impart. This important lesson that can make all of the difference in the world. Oh, Master, today as we walk with you and as we walk in relationship with you, grant it this hour for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Praise God. Amen. And amen. I'm going to tell you, you will never know what it is to walk in the blessing of God and in the favor of the Almighty. You will never know what it is, as we used to say, to walk under the spout where the glory comes out. Amen. Until you become a man or a woman of God who never has to hear the Lord ask the question, will you or won't you? God desires a people today who will walk according to His divine direction, according to His leadership and His guidance. He desires a people today whose foremost yearning in this life is to walk in the perfect will of God for their own life. When you have a burning desire to walk in the will of God, I'm going to tell you something. The Lord never has to ask you, will you or won't you? No, because he knows if I ask him, he will. If I tell him, he will. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Oh, I want to tell you, I grew up in the Pentecostal church, and I, I you know... <laughs> A lot of people probably think I'm nuts, and that's okay. I, I've about come to terms with that. But there were things even growing up in church that I never quite could understand. We believe that God still spoke. We believe that God still speaks to us by His Spirit. That oftentimes there is a still small voice within us that'll speak to us sometimes it speaks comfort sometimes it speaks encouragement sometimes it speaks direction or guidance and uh, on more than one occasion it has spoken a rebuke or a chastisement but we believe even as people in the Word of God were able to hear from God, we believe that even today believers are able to hear from God and the Almighty is able to speak directly to us as He did saints of old. We believe God still answers prayer. We believe in miracles. We believe in divine healing. We believe in deliverance from demons. We believe God is able to save and deliver the drug addict. He's able to save and deliver the alcoholic. He's able to save and deliver that one who has lost their mind because of demonic oppression and possession. He's able to set them free 
and set their feet on a firm foundation and on a steady path. Oh, we believe all these things that we read of in the Word of God. And as Pentecostal people, we believe all these things are still true today. None of these things have expired. None of these things are simply uh, experiences that saints in the past have been able to have, but we do not have access to similar experiences. But do you know what I find most Christians are completely devoid of? They are devoid of the knowledge. They are devoid of the confidence and the understanding that God has a perfect plan for our lives. He has already mapped out for us exactly what he would like for us to do and where he would like for us to go and he has already determined that the end will be better than the beginning that is the promise of God's word he's got everything mapped out when he saved us when we came to a place of faith in God, we are supposed to have come to a place not merely where we believe God is, not merely where we believe God exists, not merely where we believe God hears and answers prayer, not merely where we believe that God speaks to us today as he did his people of ancient times. But the word of God said the just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. Our entire walk from the moment we become a born again believer is supposed to be a walk that is governed by faith. And part of walking in faith and walking by faith is trusting the will of God. And if we trust the will of God, then we are always, listen to me, we are always to be seeking the will of God. A lot of people live their lives and they never one time pray a prayer and say, Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And yet in the Lord's exemplary prayer, in his example prayer, those very words are part of that prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth. In other words, do with me exactly as you do with the angels hallelujah you send them on missions you send them on tasks you tell them what to do and the word of God says that they go forth and perform that which you have asked of them oh Lord let your will be done in my life so that you can speak to me and immediately I'll respond, yes, Lord, and I won't walk, but I'll run, hallelujah, to do what you've asked me to do. That's what God desires. <laughs> that is not what he has. He never had it in the people of Israel. <laughs> Throughout the history of the nation of Israel, they were stiff-necked and stubborn people. They were self-willed, wanting to do things their own way, wanting to go in their own directions, wanting to pursue their own paths and their own endeavors. So why should it be any different for the New Testament church except 
that we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you, growing up as a kid, I used to look and think to myself, you know, what cracks me up is the Lord used to be able to talk to people in biblical times and tell them, I want you to go here. I want you to do this. I want you to talk to this one. And boom, 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 they did it. Didn't he? I said, well, why in the world would that not also be true today? If we believe God's a healer, if we believe God still fills with the Holy Ghost, if we believe God still answers prayer, if we believe God still is capable of speaking to us, then why in the world can we not have confidence and faith in the fact that God can communicate His will to us. And when He does, why in the world can we not as people of faith simply respond, Yea, Lord, and do what He's asked us to do. The Lord put me to the test when I was 16 years old. He spoke to me, one day, never forget it, as long as I live. So I want you to go to Texas. I said, Texas? Lord, why on earth would I go? I've never even visited Texas. I've never been there. I don't know if I'd like it or hate it. I don't know anything about it. He said, I want you to go there so that I can train you for your ministry. See, one of the wonderful things is a lot of times that when God asks you to do something, He's not offended if you ask for more details. Why, Lord? <laughs> what, what, what is the purpose in my doing so? Why, why do you want me to go to Texas? Well, I'm going to train you for your ministry. If you're going to be a preacher of faith, you need to learn to live by faith. You need to walk by faith and not by sight. And here I was still just a teenager. I went to my mother. I said, Mom, the Lord spoke to me and told me He wants me to go to Texas. I had no doubt in my mind that God spoke to me. No doubt in the world. Was I trepidatious? Was I a little nervous? Did I have a little anxiety? Of course I did. I didn't know anything about Texas. I had one member of my family and her offspring that lived there, my great aunt. And my great uncle, she was a bulldog. Every time she'd come up home to New England to visit during the summer months, she was famous for being Miss Hardnose. Very much a uh, authoritarian type figure, you know. I can't say she was the warmest and most welcoming of figures and all I could think to do was to call her I used to call her anyway I'd call her and pray with her on the phone talk to her I've always loved older members of my family growing up I, I've always been very family oriented so for I used to call up Dorothy and talk to her on the phone sometimes and and pray with her on the phone and stuff and I always enjoyed doing that she'd come up home and uh, she'd visit our church and she'd shout and kind of hoop around a little and I always liked that because we didn't have a lot of that going on in our church those days. Yeah, I was nervous. But honey, I immediately set out. I was working in a grocery store and I immediately set out to set in my money aside. I called some friends of our family who ran a local uh, travel agency and asked them if they could arrange a one-way ticket for me from Hartford, Connecticut to Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. My aunt said, yes, if you feel led of the Lord to come, come on down. You can stay with us. 
I said, until I can get my own place and get situated on my own, which I eventually did. I've shared this story many times in the course of my ministry, and I've told you many times over, that was the best decision I ever made in my entire life. I walked away. Did I go through some hardships? Yes. Did I go through some tough times? Yes. Unfortunately, if you're going to learn to walk by faith, that means it's not always going to be peaches and cream. Sometimes you're going to have to endure hardship as a good soldier. Yes, I went through some hardships. Yes, I went through some difficult times. Oh, but honey, let me tell you something. The positive, the good, the beneficial, the wonderful memories that I'll never forget if I live to be a thousand. Things that were splendid and wonderful so outweighed any and all of the negatives that I experienced that when I look back to that 16 year old boy getting on an airplane he was terrified to fly in to go to Texas for no other reason than God told me to go all I have are the most positive and wonderful of memories. The hardships, the difficulties, Tommy, all those things have just kind of evaporated. But all the good things that I experienced, the good lessons that I learned, those things are what I remember from that lesson in hearing from God concerning His will and obeying His voice. The greatest lesson a believer can learn is to seek, find, and walk in the will of God. This is also the least understood lesson in the church today. Many believers will spend a lifetime trying to impose their will upon God rather than learning to surrender to his plans and his purpose for their life. The joys and benefits that they forfeit in doing so are known only to the Lord. You can't even know. <laughs> you can't even know how many wonderful things God may have had in store for you that you'll never see. You'll die having never seen them because you didn't want to follow His direction. You didn't want to walk in His will. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the Word of the Lord declares, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why, Paul, why should we be transformed? Why should we not be conformed to this world? Why, he tells us, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There is no such thing as God's permissive will. It is idiotic to think that the God of heaven, the creator of all that is, who knows the end from the beginning, somehow or another, is going to concede to you 
simply because you want to walk in disobedience or in rebellion. Well, you know, there's always God's permissive will. If, you know, he wants you to do something, but you just can't find the heart to do it, well, he'll just kind of find another path to put you on. Oh, no, 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 honey. Don't work that way. Jonah was told by the Lord to go to Nineveh. He was told exactly what to preach and exactly what to say. And Jonah opted to go in another direction. Honey, when we step outside of the will of God, things never go well. Things never go easy. If you think, <laughs> I've experienced it a number of times when I knew I was walking in the will of God and things weren't going so well. And sometimes we're tempted, we say, well, Lord, I'm doing what you want me to do and things just aren't going so well. Well, think of this. How could things be going if you weren't where you are? I know somebody who talks about moving to Alabama for a job. That wasn't in my plan. That ain't what I was thinking. I wasn't, that wasn't on my list of to-dos. And I say, yeah, and for 15 months you were out of work in Dallas. The unemployment had run out. Your severance was about gone. What kind of a mess could we be in today if we just stayed right where we were? But you see, I kept praying, and I got it on video so I can prove I prayed it over and over and over again. Master, thy will be done. Lord, open a door. Send us somewhere. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. I said, Lord, whatever door you open, I'll walk through it. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to fight you about it. Whatever door you open. He opened the door to the last place in heaven on earth that I ever thought I'd ever live in my entire life. And please, Alabama folks, I'm not saying Alabama's a terrible place. It's just not anywhere I ever dreamed I would live. Let's put it that way. And God opened the door for us to come here. And did I come without arguing? Did I come without debating? Did I come without whining and griping to God about going to Alabama? You better believe I did. You know why? Because I trust God. Hallelujah. I learned as a 16-year-old boy, glory to God, that when God opens a door, honey, I don't care how hard it is, once you've passed through that door, if you you try to fight him and stay on this side of that door, you're going to have it a whole lot harder. Never goes well. The storms will come. Your ship will be battered. And listen, folks, listen to me. Jonah was asleep in the belly of the ship. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there are a lot of Christians who know how to fight God and tell God no. Listen to me. Oh, and they still can sleep. They convince themselves that all will be well. I've outsmarted the Almighty. <laughs> yes, God, you fell for it again. I'm just going to sleep here in the belly of the ship until you decide what direction you want to take me in as part of your permissive will. Baloney. It only gets worse. 
Folks, I'm going to tell you, you know how many people bring tumult and storms into the lives of those around them because they don't want to listen. They don't want to obey God. They wind up causing their family grief. They wind up causing their friends grief. I know people today, I'm going to talk plain today, because honey, I'm so fed up of trying to talk around things, and there are some people out there, some of you need to hear exactly what I'm going to say. I know people who for the last 20 plus years have been fighting God and walking contrary to the will of God for your life and every time you call me on the telephone all I hear is tumult and storm all I hear is craziness and insanity and lunacy am I telling the truth you're disturbing my world your storm is rocking my boat If I could, I'd pick you up and throw you over the side so that I didn't have to listen to all the foolishness you be talking all the time. Tommy knows what I'm talking about. Your life's a mess. For the last 20-something years, you've had nothing but grief and woe and trouble. You've had one disaster after another. And then you call me up and you bark at me about how. Uh, somebody's cursing you and somebody with witchcraft. Honey, ain't none of that true. Not one word you're saying is true. You're in the belly of the fish and the only reason you ain't dead is because of the mercy of God see people read the story of Jonah and they don't think they don't realize and the word of God said that God sent the storm well we can understand that God sent the storm. Oh, well, yeah, we understand God punishing. We understand. That wasn't a punishment. No, it wasn't a punishment. That was an attention getter. Honey, sometimes there's stuff that comes your way. It's not God trying to punish you. It's God trying to get your attention. Trying to make you realize the error of your ways, which Jonah did. Am I telling the truth? But then when we get to that part of the story where the word of the Lord said, God prepared a great fish. We fail to recognize that is the mercy of God in action. You throw Jonah off that boat, what's going to happen? He's going to drown. But God prepared a safe place for Jonah even in the depths of a stormy sea. Hallelujah. Oh, my God, have mercy. If he can get your attention and get you to recognize that you are going the wrong way, you're not following his leadership. You're not following his direction. If he can get you to recognize that, then the next step is a safe place in the storm for a while. And God puts you in that safe place because stubborn people Rebellious people seldom, <laughs> seldom turn around quickly. Now, Jonah needed some time. He needed some time in the belly of that fish to rethink his rebellion and to rethink his disobedience. When the time finally come that that fish threw Jonah up, allowing him to walk onto the shore. 
the word of God tells us that once again, listen to me, once again, God gave the same directions to Jonah he had given him to begin with. Now, go to Nineveh and preach. And here's what I want you to preach. Jonah still had a choice. <laughs> oh, but you know what? Most people, if they got a brain in their head, after you've survived the storm, and after you come out of the fish, you got enough sense to know, maybe it's time for me to do what God's asked me to do. Am I telling the truth? Amen. The word of the Lord says, in Matthew 6, 31 through 33, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. God says, listen, instead of worrying about the small stuff, just understand, I know what you need. And there is a surefire way to make sure that your needs will always be met. Just put the kingdom of God and acting right and doing, by the way, acting right and doing right is walking in God's will. So you just focus on that, and guess what? You never go hungry. You never go homeless. You never go without a roof. You never go without clothes. I'll take care of you. I know what you need. So we know the small stuff is promised. All we have to do is stay focused and continue to walk in obedience to the will and mind and plan of God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, a famous promise most of us know. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose or His will. Many believers falsely take this promise to mean that the Lord will accept our missteps and outright acts of disobedience and will make a good outcome even from those bad decisions. But this is a misreading and a false understanding of this passage. That is not at all what God is saying. He says all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called. How? According to His purpose, His plan, His will. You can know that if you're striving to walk in obedience to the plan and will of God for you, you can know that there will not be a bad outcome in the end. Am I telling the truth? The outcome will be good. In Genesis chapter 50, the last chapter of Genesis, one of the very last verses of the first book of the Bible we read these words from the mouth of Joseph. But as for you, he said to his brothers, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Joseph said, y'all sold me into slavery because you were petty and you were jealous of me. You meant evil. You were trying to do me evil, but God was using your evil to put me in a better place and in a better position. My God, if we need a lesson in trust in the will of God, if we need a lesson in appreciating where God puts us and why He puts us there, my God, right there. 
even when we feel like the worst of the worst has happened, what is God? Glory to God. What is God lining us up for? <laughs> oh, we, we may be in the ditch today wearing our coat of many colors, but we're going to be in Pharaoh's house tomorrow. Glory to God. We're going to be serving in Pharaoh's court. We're going to be blessed and highly favored. We're going to be in a position to save the lives of the very jealous, petty family members who sought to destroy us. And yet, God speaks to his people every day. And they stand there mulling over whether or not they have a mind to obey. And the Spirit of the Lord asks them, will you or won't you? Are you going to do what I've asked you to do or aren't you going to do what I've asked you to do? 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 32, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now listen to what Paul says. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. My friend, there's little doubt that rebellion against the plan of God is about as great an offense as any believer can commit. I knew a rather famous preacher some years ago, a woman, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, I've spoken to her, and I've told her the LGBT community adores her. They love her. She could be such a catalyst for revival and renewal and restoration of faith in the lives of so many LGBT people. And I've told her that is the direction I want her to walk in. That's the path I want her to follow. But she doesn't want to do it. She doesn't want to do it. She's been the butt of jokes. She's been ridiculed and made fun of for so many years. And people have said so many nasty things about her that she just can't find the stamina. She can't find the strength to put up with all the put downs that she knows she'll get if she devotes the majority of her attention to affirming ministry. She wound up with cancer. Paul said, this is why so many are sickly and weak among you and many sleep. She died. The Spirit of the Lord said to me, too many believers think that sickness and weakness and death are a punishment. He said, it's not about punishment. I'm not punishing anybody. <laughs> he said, I'm the coach and I call the plays. And when the players don't want to play what I've called them to play, I reserve the right to take them out of the game. You'll see them in heaven. 
Nobody said you're not going to see them in heaven. I believe Ananias and Sapphira are going to be in heaven. I really do. I don't believe Ananias and Sapphira went to hell all because they lied to Peter. No, but the Lord said, listen, you're not going to play by the rules. I'm going to take you out of the game. Hello now. Like, the, like Martin Luther King Jr. said, long life has its place, you know. But you don't want to play by the rules. You don't want to follow my leading, my guidance, my direction. Then instead of allowing you to have a long life that is fulfilled and blessed and prosperous, I'll just take you out of the game. Hello now. 1 Samuel 18, 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, this is what Samuel said to uh, Saul, the king of, of Israel. He hath also rejected thee from being king. Psalm 37, 3 through 5. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Luke 22, 39 through 42, and he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Tell you, there are times this old flesh doesn't want to do, <laughs> doesn't want to go, doesn't want to experience, doesn't want to have to go through what the Lord is asking us to go through. But the spirit within says, sorry, this is the path that I've chosen for the moment. But don't worry, it looks dark today. It's going to look awful bright three days from now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hebrews 12 and 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look at the example of Jesus. He obeyed the will. He followed the plan. He stuck with the plan. Even though he didn't like what he had to go through. My Lord have mercy. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of crapola that I have to go through, folks. I get it from people on the religious right. I get it from people in the LGBT community. I get more dung flung at me than any monkey in any zoo in America. I don't like it. But if this is what I must do in order to walk in the will of God, then so be it. In Mark chapter 3, verse 35, For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother, Jesus said. John chapter 9, verse 31. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God, listen, and doeth his will, him he heareth. 
Philippians 2.13 For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Hebrews 10, 35 through 37, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward, or great promise of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he shall, he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Ye have need of patience. After you've done the will of God, you will receive the promise. Oh, hallelujah. 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. 1 John 2.17 And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The best way to walk in the will of the Lord is for us to allow him to show us what his end game is for the direction that he has given us. Truth be told, Jonah knew exactly what would happen if he went to Nineveh as he had been commanded. Jonah knew exactly what was going to happen. He just didn't like the outcome. He didn't want to preach judgment and destruction only for the Lord to honor the people of Nineveh's repentance and spare them making Jonah look as though he had misspoken. But you see, God did not ask Jonah to achieve a certain end. God said, go to Nineveh and say this. Oh my goodness. Go to Nineveh and preach this message. And then Jonah said it. Yeah, but you're telling me to tell them that you're going to destroy them in a few days and everything's going to be wiped out. And then you're going to turn around and you're going to spare them. You're going to have mercy on them. And, you, and by God, I'm going to look like quite the fool. I'm a prophet of God. I'm not in the habit of misspeaking. I'm not in the habit of saying things that don't come to pass. had nothing to do with Jonah's unwillingness to go there had nothing to do with him experiencing being stoned or him being killed or him being, you know, mobbed by the people. No, 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 no. His pride was going to take a ding. Jonah chapter 3 verses 5 through 10 so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God, yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. 
Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. Then Jonah 5, 1 through 3. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, listen, was this not my saying when I was yet in my country? He said, didn't I say this would happen? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah appeared to have told a fib. There's such a thing as the prophet speaking out of turn. Doesn't make him a bad guy. Just means that uh, at that particular instance, he thought he had something to say from the Lord, and it really wasn't from the Lord. Well, Jonah had never experienced this. When he prophesied, what he prophesied came to pass, and therefore this was a huge blow to his ego, and dare I say, to his prophetic career. And now he is so hurt by this. The Lord, just kill me. Just take me home now. Oh, now I look like I'm a, a false prophet. Now I look like I've misspoken. I knew this was going to happen. I want to tell you today, the Lord devoted an entire book of the ancient scriptures to this one single lesson on walking in his will. How on earth can we not understand that the importance of walking in the will of God? When the Lord speaks to us and offers us direction or commands us to make a specific move, never, never should he have to follow up with what he has spoken, with the question, will you or won't you? Amen. Lord, I don't ever want you to have to ask, will I obey or won't I obey? I just want to say, yes, Lord, and begin to do what you've told me to do. Praise the name.